Hi, I'm Thomas Burkhardt here for NASA Spaceflight at Astros headquarters here with Benjamin. Benjamin, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. So why don't we start with a little bit about what you do here at Astro and your background that led you to come here. Sure, I lead Astra's design engineering. Um, so think of that as like designing rockets um, and the launcher and everything that goes with that, the software that backs it up, um, as well as leading our operations, which is really a few things. One of that, uh, one of those things is all the testing of our rockets. Uh, the other is the operation of manufacturing the rockets and manufacturing the launchers. And the last piece of operations, of course, is launch operations. So going about actually getting our rockets up into space. Amanda, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, why don't you just start with giving us what you do at Astra and what led you to join Astra in the first place? Uh, so I'm the first stage production manager. Uh, so I manage the team that fabricates the main uh, liquid oxygen tanks and fuel tanks, as well as all of the major sub-assemblies for the rocket fluidics. So all the valves, racketry, tubes. Uh, also do all of the sheet metal components for the fairings and the upper stage. Uh, and my team is also responsible for doing the final integration of the major components from the other production teams. So the engine bay, as well as the upper stage, my team is responsible for doing the final integration, as well as all of the electrical and pneumatic checkouts um, before we send the rocket out the door. We're currently in the process of figuring out how we really ramp production uh, from you know, one rocket every eight months to one rocket per month. Uh, my whole reason for wanting to join Astra was uh, I've been in the aerospace industry for just over 10 years now, mostly in commercial and general aviation uh, and test engineering, and have always wanted to get into the space industry. I've always wanted to, you know, as a little kid, wanting to be, wanting to work on rockets. Uh, I have degrees in aerospace engineering, and it's always been a dream to be able to work for a company that uh, is able to send rockets into space. <laughs> Bryson, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Let's talk a little bit about your background and what led you to come to Astra. So you started with SpaceX and now you're here. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about uh, your background and how, what you're doing here now? Yeah, um, so I've got a mixed aerospace and automotive background. Spent a number of years at SpaceX doing manufacturing engineering, building up some of the factory for Falcon 9 1.1. Um, from there, a couple of years later, I went to a company called NEO, um, where I met a couple other folks that I actually work with today. Um, and we were working on building aluminum electric cars, uh, building factories in China, so doing forming, stamping, uh, body assembly uh, in particular. And that basically brings me here to Astra. Gio, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. So why don't you just start with a little bit about what you do at Astra and your background that led to that. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm the Senior Vice President for Product Engineering here at Astra, and I've joined Astra as of uh, about six months ago. And my uh, background prior to Astra was working a little over 11 years uh, at a company called Blue Origin up in Seattle. Uh, and prior to that, my, my background is a myriad of transportation devices, uh, marine and aerospace once before, and then automotive uh, way back in the early days of my career. How closely do you work from the engineering side of things with the production side of things as far as scaling the production of Astro rockets? Yeah, great question. So I think it's fundamentally important for products of this class, especially at the volumes that we want to make them, to, to work extraordinarily close with manufacturing and actually to design for manufacturing. Everybody talks about that. We want to make sure that we're actually doing it. So Bryson and I are uh, huge fans of ensuring that uh, the manufacturing is a big part of the product development process that is giving us input into what future capabilities manufacturing is going to have and how we can best take advantage of them. And we engineer for the production processes that we have uh, and the production processes that are easy to scale and easy to implement within our, our framework. So I've, we've seen a lot of people here around Astra coming in from lots of different backgrounds, and I believe you're coming in with no prior aerospace-specific experience. Can you talk a little bit about the things you may have learned at Apple that are being applied here at Astra now? Sure. Well, I'm not going to talk specifically about Apple, um, but I will talk to a little bit about some of the things I've learned um, in my career. Um, my background is really around designing technologies that are often very difficult and then figuring out how to productize them in a way that you can actually get those to literally tens of millions of people. Um, and so that often requires kind of a process that transitions you from technology survey to technology development 
uh, to integration and productization, um, and then manufacturing and manufacturing for scale. And actually, after manufacturing and delivering to customers, it also involves taking customer feedback and baking that back into the design and rolling through. Um, so uh, that piece of my experience, that kind of going from prototypes to products, is particularly relevant to what we're trying to do here at Astra, which is to fundamentally change um, the way rockets are thought of today and orbital delivery is thought of today, which is really where almost every vehicle, you could give it a name, um, to the world of being able to mass produce, get to daily launch, and as a result, achieve really truly low cost and rapid access to space. Once the factory has finished its upcoming expansion, how quickly will you be able to ramp up rocket production here at Astra? Yeah, so we're uh, expecting to do some form of a continuous ramp um, after we scale into the new layout. So we're moving into uh, the next layout, which is designed around weekly production. Uh, we actually could do monthly production out of our current layout, but we would rather just make the move now, get used to the layout, and then have a nice easy scale up transition um, so that when we introduce new versions of the rocket, there's one change happening at a time. We're not changing the rocket and the factory. And what does that new layout look like? So the new layout, uh, a rocket ships out a different door. So the flow of the factory is, uh, is different from how it is today. Um, it goes across the entire building instead of just through the section that we have today. Uh, you'll also see more pieces of automation equipment. So uh, you'll see a uh, line for producing the majority of the first stage tank. Uh, that's basically the, the roots of the line that will serve us up to a rocket a day. So we are taking some big chunks with our next version of the factory. Um, and that will just run at lower utilization until we're at full speed. Um, you'll see a couple of other areas uh, expand that are similar to the way that they're being built today. Uh, the engine assembly area will be similar, uh, just with more stations, and the machine shop will triple in size. Fundamentally, uh, the way to think about it is, is that Astra today uh, occupies a very small portion of our facility um, that we're in the middle of doing a large build out on. And so, um, the major changes that we're really engaged on doing are in um, scaling up what is really a setup for delivering um, you know, a small number of rockets. And now that we have a design that we're ready to scale, really building out the factory to do that. Now, when you make that change, when you do that expansion, you discover all sorts of things that you can improve um, along the way, um, especially when you go, okay, I have uh, an additional 150,000 square feet to work with. What is the biggest engineering focus at Astra right now? I think the, the biggest engineering focus at Astra right now is, is, um, falls into two categories. Um, first category is really thinking about the people and the individuals and the folks that we're wanting to attract and continue to build our engineering team uh, with. So folks that can augment or complement the, the uh, the, the team that it has, the passion uh, that Astra has had so far about building these smaller class vehicles at a rate that's unprecedented in the, uh, in the industry. And the second aspect is about the, the technical side. So really looking at the technology that we have in, in the current vehicle and making sure that we deeply understand what makes those, that configuration or that vehicle function and that we maximize our learning in our future launches and then we take all that forward into the design of our next vehicles. What are some of the similarities between the end products that Astra is hoping to deliver versus a product that say Apple might deliver to customers? Well, I think uh, you know products are different than prototypes and so in that respect there are some commonalities. Um, Apple delivers uh, amazing products in very, very high volume and Astra is looking to turn around and create real products that are also delivered in volume. And so what you have to do to generate a product um, versus a prototype is very different. You have to develop a capability that starts really in design, connecting manufacturing engineering with design engineering with operations to understand what is the product, how is it going to be operated, how is it going to be used, um, what are the scenarios that you're trying to deliver for your customers, and really focusing the design around that. Um, and then you take that and incorporate all that information in your design, both of the design of the vehicle itself, but, or the product itself, but also the factory that creates that um, product uh, in such a way that you get kind of this global optimization all the way through. 
I think one thing that I really love about um, Apple is that it thinks very, very much about its customer stories and what is it really trying to deliver for customers. And so instead of creating the kitchen sink, it does a few things really, really well as opposed to everything but in a mediocre way. That's part of what I love about Astra, which is this intense focus on really just low cost, rapid response, active to, um, access to space. And that, um, that focus allows you to make a whole set of design decisions um, that yield something that is fundamentally great, insanely great at what it does as opposed to trying to do all these different things. One like specific example, our rocket fits in a shipping container. As a matter of fact, all of our ground support equipment also fits in shipping containers, which means that our system is constrained to be mobile. It means that we can pick up and we can go launch from Alaska. We can go launch from somewhere else. What sets Astra's rockets apart from the competition? I, you know, I think it's some of the philosophies that really attracted me to, to the Astra team. The idea that simple soonest, you know, trying to keep things um, sophisticated in one sense of the word, because a rocket like this still has to be quite sophisticated, but but also very simple, right? The electric propulsion system is a simple start to a propulsion system for a booster class. Um, I think the that philosophy really, really hit home with me, the idea of making things simple to understand, simple to uh, to build. Um, and so that's that's an aspect that that I think sets sets Astra apart to from the competition. Um, I think looking at tools and material systems that are more readily available, maybe even things that have adjacencies in, um, in my old automotive um, world where we look at things like the F-150 that is now an aluminum uh, structure. It uses alloys that are very interesting for us to look at and they're at a cost point that makes a lot of sense for us to, to keep the vehicle class and the Astra vehicle class at a very low cost compared to our competition. How do you balance having several rockets in various stages of production versus wanting to implement changes from those all-important flight tests uh, before you launch the next time? Yeah, so that's a really key question for us at, at Astra because we're looking to build at an unprecedented rate. So we're, we're working through the activities of ensuring that our systems, not just the engineering release system, but also the manufacturing system or procurement systems, our build system, so the work orders that actually build our, our vehicles are flexible enough to have these incremental upgrades um, inserted during the, the build process. And then Bryson and I are working carefully to, to align up systems so that we can define at a particular serial number or maybe even at a particular date when we want to insert those, those engineering changes. And again, those engineering changes go through the life cycle that we talked about a second ago where they'll get verified and uh, tested in component level testing, and then we'll finally be able to release them and say, yes, we can insert them into our production environment for a given configuration of, of the vehicle. How do you balance having several rockets under production while also wanting to learn from every test flight and every test that you do, and maybe having to go back to rockets that have already started production to implement fixes or upgrades? Yeah, that's a pretty good question, actually. Um, so if you're going to be making a change to a rocket that's on the line, uh, typically that change is going to be in the one to two percent of the build of materials. So it's actually not a lot of the rocket. So you, you you don't want to stop building because you might have a change coming. You want to just keep building and find a way to make that tweak on the line. Um, one thing that you do, that we do, uh, to package protect for that is have a little bit of space at the end of the line um, so that if we build a rocket all the way through, um, if we're almost done and we need to rework something, there is a place for that rocket to physically live to do that rework. Um, and typically, uh, we would look at the change that needs to be made and how invasive it is to uh, actually make the change on the line. And if it's not totally necessary, uh, we can roll it in you know, just on future rockets and we don't have to actually upgrade the ones that are existing on the line. What are you already implementing involving the scalability of rocket production at Astra? Well, one thing that's really, really important um, when you're developing products is developing a recipe. And that recipe is something that then you can uh, train new employees with very quickly, and that allows you to scale. Um, so if you have a small team of folks and they're all experts on how to design the rocket and how to build the rocket, um, but it's all in their heads, then of course you can't scale. And so the work over you know, the last, even you know, the last year has really been 
um, not just the design work, but also the design for manufacturing work and the documentation that goes into um, making sure that we have a really great information set for training technicians, training operators, um, for both the building of our rockets as well as the operating of, of launches. Um, and doing that, and doing that in a way that's backed by a great software data platform is what enables us to really scale. What are you seeing is proving to be harder, building the rocket or launching the rocket? You know, there are unique challenges in both the design of rockets, in the manufacturing of rockets, in the testing of rockets, um, and in the launching of rockets. One of the things that is particularly challenging about the launch phase um, is that there are a lot of things that you can't control for. Um, weather, for example, is a great example of things that you can't control for. Um, also, there are many things that you can't test on the ground. You know, for example, there is a big chunk of our operation that happens without gravity and in the vacuum of space. Well, operating an entire upper stage in a vacuum, gravityless environment doesn't happen outside of a flight. And so there are major challenges in, uh, in that. We have the benefit of our last flight where we got a bunch of flight data. And so we can use that to inform all the aspects of our operation, which is great. Um, but there's always that challenge as you build up data from those um, sections of flight and to, in predicting the design changes, their impact on you know, behavior in areas that you can't verify um, on the ground. Um, we do a tremendous amount of work to verify everything that we can um, on the ground. So we have something called our Mocket, which is a system that actually allows us to simulate flights across an entire rocket um, uh, while we're on the ground and build, build confidence uh, in our system. And that's really, really critical. Um, and that's actually something that's shared in almost all autonomous robotics, is having a system like this to allow you to test and, and verify. So, um, so, yep, launching rockets is hard. Building rockets is hard. Designing rockets is hard. But, you know, the hard things are worthwhile. And uh, the opportunity here is, is really to fundamentally simplify the design of rockets to the point where they're easier to manufacture, where, and then use software so that they're easier to operate. Um, and if we succeed in those goals, I, I think um, we will unlock something that's really important and, and frankly worthwhile. Hard problems attract amazing people, like just to be totally blunt. Um, and the chance to, you know, for somebody like me who's already had a long career somewhere else to get to work with a bunch of really great people um, on really hard problems is just something very special. We only live one life, and so you know when you recognize those rare opportunities, you take them. Um, I think uh, the second piece is, is you know having been through the development of the iPod and the iPhone and the iPad and the watch and the list goes on. Um, the chance to have real impact um, that makes people's lives better matters. Um, and for me personally, I think it's incredibly exciting um, if we are able to fundamentally drop the threshold that it takes to get to space and enable a whole suite of space applications um, for developers. That's a like that unlocks all of their creativity. Um, and it's actually not about what we think they're going to do. It's about enabling them to go uh, be unleashed and do what they're going to do. Um, and that is. That is just incredibly important. It's incredibly powerful. Um, and uh, it's going to take a lot of work to get there. But getting there is a big deal.